We should be stopping 30 times a day instead of 10 times a day. And people say, oh, but surely you're not able to get the work done if you're stopping so much. My response to that is we're able to get so much work done because we're stopping so much. We're doing more in eight hours and most people are doing in 30, 40 hours. So then when it's game on and we have to produce, we can do it because we've all these problems eliminated. We have a really, really exciting episode for you guys today. We're going to be talking about a principle known as stop and fix. It's a concept that has radically transformed Ryan's life, his business, and his everything. And so we're really excited to share that with you. Ryan, sell it to us. Why is this absolutely essential to bake into all of our lives? Yep. Stop and fix. That that concept, stop and fix, is so powerful. Uh, I'll just go back nine years, actually nine years from this week. Our company was really disorganized. It was an absolute mess, to be honest. There was orders going out late. Production was never on time with all these operational problems. And it was a really, really stressful environment. And I didn't really know where to turn, to be honest. And I went home one night and I started looking up on YouTube how to manage production, how to run a business more smoothly. And I came across something called lean manufacturing. And one of the core principles that I seen straight away when I looked up, when I looked into lean more, was this idea of stopping to fix things. When you've got a problem, because before that, our mindset was just work, 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 keep going, get the products out the door, keep production going at all cost. But what Lean taught me to do is to stop and fix when you see a problem or when you see that something can be better. And this was really counterintuitive for, for me and for all of us in our company. We were like, what, what do you mean stop? <laughs> <laughs> Surely we have all this product to get shipped. We have to get all this stuff out the door. We haven't time to stop. But it wasn't until we stopped, slowed down, and improved small things that it, that that we actually started to go faster. Do you have any like really tangible, simple examples from your own life of when you've stopped and fixed something just so it's cemented in our heads before we kind of go full steam ahead? Yep, a really good example on a, on a micro level. It almost seems silly, but uh, I've got gates at my home, electric gates, and there's a remote control button for opening the gates. So last week I was driving up to the gate and the remote control always kind of sits in the cup holder or like <laughs> in between the seats in the car and I'm always fumbling around to try and look for it. And I was like, I am not going to go through with this anymore. So I stopped. I literally stopped. <laughs> the car was still taken over, jumped out, ran into the house, got some double-sided tape, double-sided tape the remote control onto the dashboard of the car. So now every time I drive up there, the remote control is right there. Unbelievable. But the whole power was stopping the fix. Mm. I didn't put it on a list. I didn't say, I'll do it sometime. I'll do it next week. I'll do it next month. I was like, I am stopping right now in my tracks and fixing this so that I never have to go through that pain again. <laughs> so good. And so that yeah. was like an under five minute fix. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, And it yeah. saved you a lifetime of pain. If we really oversell it, a lifetime of frustration. Yep. And, and that that's all we're encouraging people to do. And that's all we do at our company. If we see, see something that really annoys us, we stop and we fix it. Mm. There and then, stop and fix. Unreal. Love it. So level one, individual in your organization, you know, every single member that's a part of your team, they first and foremost have to have the authority or their permission to actually stop. You know, I think a lot of people listen to this, they're like, well, you know, my in my team, if I just stop work, like, you know, I'd get the sack. So the conditions have to be right. So talk to us a little bit about that. 100%. The environment has to be conducive to this type of thinking. So where I really internalized this thinking was in Japan. We done a tour of the Toyota factory in, uh, in Toyota City in Japan. And it was one of those moments that I'll never forget because we were walking through the, uh, the, the production facility we were on a tour with 14 or 15 other lean leaders and all of a sudden the entire production line stopped. It just stopped dead and everybody stood, like all these Japanese workers standing with their arms crossed, waiting on the line to stop again. And I was like, what, what is going on here? And I said to the tour guide, I asked the tour guide, what, what is happening? This is crazy that this whole line stops. How many millions does that not cost for Toyota to stop their production line? And the, the tour guide said, no, no, like the line stops five or six times every hour. Every hour? A every hour. So I was like, they stop and fix, stop and fix. If they see something that can be better, they see an improvement opportunity, they see a defect, some abnormality that, that isn't correct, 
Every single person in the Toyota factory has the power to pull a physical and on cord. It's a physical cord, like right overhead, you know, on the line. They have the authority and the freedom to pull that, stop the line, and f- focus on fixing the problem. Mm. And what that does is creates a sense of urgency. Because if you can imagine that the line's going, 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 and there's a problem, oh, yep, it's grand, we'll fix it next week, we'll fix it next month, stick it on a list. No, no, they stop. And because of the... Because w- when you see the whole line stop, that is a, a, it's a scary scene. Like, you're, like what are all these 80, 100 more people doing on this particular part of the line? What are they doing when, when the line stopped? They're actually stopping and waiting on it to start again, mm. so, which creates a sense of urgency to get the problem fixed there and then. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's You're not just kind of putting it in a list somewhere and you're like, oh, I'll get around to that someday. It's like, no, no, no. I know for a fact my whole team is waiting for me to solve this problem. Exactly. Yeah. Does someone have to, like, in the stop and fix kind of mentality, do you have to be able to solve the problem yourself? You, you don't, and it's a good question. It's a good point because I, th- I think the reason that a lot of people don't stop to fix something because okay. they're like, I don't know how to fix it, so I'm not going to stop. Yeah. But you don't have to have the solution. All you is be aware that here's something that can be about to produce a defect or we have produced a defect and I'm going to stop and you may rely on some of your work colleagues to come and help you with the improvement, but that's okay. You, you don't have to know the solution. All you have to know is that you have identified that something can be better and you're going to stop. And the reason why Toyota do that, because Toyota are obviously, as you say all the time, they're not just the best car manufacturer in the world, they're the best manufacturers in the world. What they do with the amount of people they have is nothing short of mind-blowing. Do you think the reason they're able to go so fast is because they take so much time to stop? Or what do you think the big benefit of that concept is for them? Exactly. It's stop, go slow to go fast. Mm. And uh, another thing that we say a lot is that if you have no problems, that's a problem. (laughs) You know, no problem is a problem. Yeah. So if you're asking somebody in the line or somebody in the factory at our factory, how's everything going today? Yep, grand, no problems, everything's good. That's not right because there's always problems. Interesting. There's always things that can be better. There's always things that are have the potential to create a defect. So we should be stopping more. We should be stopping 30 times a day instead of 10 times a day because we can fix more problems. And people say, oh, but surely you're not able to get the work done if you're stopping so much. And my response to that is we're able to get so much work done because we're stopping so much. Mm. We're doing more in eight hours and most people are doing in 30, 40 hours because we're stopping, 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 fixing, fixing, fixing. Sure. So then when it's game on and we have to produce, we can do it because we've all these problems eliminated. Yeah, and I remember in the eight wastes episode that that we did, you talked about how much waste that defects actually bring to an organization. So by stopping and fixing, you're reducing the number of defects, which reduces the amount of things you need to go back and fix. So yes, you may be going slower kind of in the moment, but then you save all this kind of backlog of waste in the future. Exactly. And the whole focus is around quality. If we focus on quality, everything else looks after itself. Yeah. Because the cost of fixing something afterwards is 10 times more than Mm. if you can catch it at the source. So if we're manufacturing a particular product, and we can see that something just isn't right, that hole should be a tiny bit bigger, we stop, we go to the design department, we have a quick meeting, can we change the size of the hole? Yep, we can, let's get it done, let's get it approved, and then we start going again. Unreal. Because if that problem goes down the line, and we have 100 or 200 or 300 products, that problem becomes bigger. Mm. But if we can stop it at the source, but then the key to stopping it at the source is to develop a culture where people recognise and are given the freedom to stop. Yeah. So moving on to level two then, which is kind of on a more organizational level. Yeah. So I get on the on the personal level, yeah, okay, you stop the thing that you're doing, you you fix the thing that's annoying you. But then on an organizational level, you're like developing your entire team to become these like absolutely epic problem solvers. It's not just here, go here and, you know, punch your clock in and punch your clock out and do the thing you always do. It's like, actually, no, no, no. You have to have your eyes wide open to, you're like looking for problems always. Whenever you see a problem, you're constantly thinking about ways to, to improve it. Yeah, exactly. What we're really doing is developing a world-class team of problem solvers. Mm. World-class problem solvers. That's really what we're doing. Where every single person is looking for opportunities to make things better. 
not just the leaders, not just the managers, because believe it or not, some of the best ideas come from the people that are on the floor working with the product, w- working at the Gemba, where the work happens. That's where some of our best ideas come from because we want people to engage their brain. We want people to think. And if people can think on a micro level about stopping and fixing things that annoy them on their work day or during the work day, they can take that same thinking into their life mm. and they can stop and fix bigger things, bigger problems that they're having. So that stop and fix philosophy starts at a micro level but ultimately ends up being a bigger thing. It's really interesting. So yeah. on that bigger kind of level, uh, across your entire business, like how would you say Stop and Fix has like elevated the standard of your business or improved your business in general? Something that you said earlier was whenever you just put something on a list far, far away, it can kind of be easy to, to let it slip. Whereas if you're constantly in the moment stopping and fixing, stopping and fixing, stopping and fixing, yeah. it forces everything to... I would say, like, maintain quite a high standard all the time. It really does. And if people are prepared to have a substandard, but a thread hanging out of the upholstery and a defect on the paint, that's, that's, that isn't, that's a downward spiral. What we're doing and what we're engaging people to do is to stop and fix small things, which elevates the standard, which keeps the standard really, really high. And that that is an upward spiral. Oh, it yes. really is. Yeah. Actually, I was just about to say, I feel like... Seat and Matters is an upward spiral because every single time we go to the factory, it just gets better and better and better and better. And the more we do these podcasts, the more I'm starting to understand, ah, that's why it's constantly getting better because the standard, because of stop and fix, is just getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And, uh, you know, the ripple effect of that or the compound interest effect of that is just insane. People go to, to, to your business and they're like, how on earth did you guys get here? And it's like, well, it's just because we've been doing this now for nine years. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just a compound effect. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So are there moments where, like, let's be realistic here, because, you know, people on YouTube, people who listen to this podcast, they live in the real world, as yeah. we all do. Are there things that you're not able to, to stop and fix, you know, like if like when we went to Toyota recently in England, you know, some of their improvements cost like 200 grand and probably three weeks to build and all that sort of stuff. So you obviously can't stop and fix everything in the moment. Do you have like a, like a threshold of if it takes over X amount of time or, you know, how do you kind of navigate that tension? Yeah, it's a good point. Most things are small things and we encourage people to stop and fix small things all the time, like four or five, six, seven, 10 times a day as much as they want. They have the freedom to stop and fix whenever they want. And when it goes to the next level where it's a bigger thing that kind of needs approval because, you you know, if it costs money or it's something that needs uh, input from different departments, we have a system, I've actually got one right here, with improvement cards. So we've got these improvement cards dotted right around our facility and about 30 different locations so you're never more than five or six steps away from one of these. <laughs> so if it's something that you can't fix there and then, you capture it. Mm. And this is something we talk a lot about is the benefit of capturing the idea. Because some of the best improvements have been just lost. They've just went into the ether yeah. because nobody has taken the time to write them down. So we've made the process of capturing your idea really, really easy to encourage everybody to do it. And the result is that we get 20 or 30 of these filled out every single day. Unbelievable. So our problem now, and I'm being really honest here, our problem is that we have so many improvements that we can't get them all done. (laughs) You know, it's a good problem to have. Most companies are the the other way about. They can't find ways to engage their people in coming up with uh, identifying opportunities. Mm -hmm. We have so many, we don't know how to get them all done. Sure. But we're working through that. But these improvement cards are a brilliant way to capture the idea if you can't do it in the moment. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the people who listen to this podcast are at different stages, mainly small to medium-sized businesses. So there yeah. are really massive, you know, public, publicly traded companies that also listen to the show. The stage you're at in your business, you know, where do you go forward from there? Like, do you start to hire like teams of people that are just working on improvements? Do you build out like an improvement department or what are kind of some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, we already have an improvement team. We call it a Kaizen team. And we do see that team getting bigger because as we identify more and more improvement opportunities, the list gets bigger and bigger, (laughs) uh, which is a really good thing. Actually, it's a really good thing. So yes, we do see the improvement team getting bigger in the future. Yeah, I love that. And 
the author of Getting Things Done, I can't remember his name, David Allen, maybe, David something Allen, like yeah. that. He says, um, ideas are like slippery fish. If you don't capture them right away, they'll just slip out of your hands. Uh, and it's so, so true. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, so people are working on the shop floor every single day and you've made it so easy. Any ideas they have, they'll either stop and they'll fix, or if it's big, they'll just almost an arm's length, grab yeah. the card, jot it down. Do you have a system to then like go through all those cards or how do you decide what to what to act on first? Any insights into your process behind that? We do, and again, like everything we do, it's so simple. It's a big, huge Pareto board. So the Pareto uh, concept of oh, yeah. 20% of the ideas will get you 80% of the results. So we Pareto these cards oh, and focus on the top 20%. Because we can spend our whole lives fixing small things, and that's good. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that that doesn't work. But if we can focus on 20% that we think we'll get 80% of the results from, that that's what we do. But some of the best ideas and some of the most business-changing ideas have came from these simple cards. Unbelievable. Because the people on the floor, the people on the shop floor, the people in your office, the people in your business have the ideas. But why does most people not ask them? Yeah, and as you said earlier, when people start to focus on the small things, it actually activates their brain to focus on the bigger things. Yes, yeah. Do you have an example of someone who, you know, inside the business started working on small things that then came up with just a massive business change and stop and fix sort of situation? Yeah, because we're encouraging people to come up with small incremental improvements every day to stop and fix small things, what that does is starts an upward spiral of larger improvements and business change and improvements. A really good example is Patty, who is very well known. He works in our wood department at St. Matters. Patty is making improvements all the time. Every day he's like, stop and fixing, stop and fixing, stop and fixing. Mm. And he had this particular problem for putting inserts into plywood with a drill, right? And every time he would put the insert in, his arm kind of kicked a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when it got to the end. And he was like, there has to be a better way. And he kept looking at it, looking at it. Then he sourced a, like an upright uh, drill inserter machine. It didn't really work. And then he got a another machine and he kept tweaking it and trying this and trying that. Then ultimately it led on to another improvement, which ended up, uh, he ended up sourcing a machine, which automatically inserts the D-nuts. And now the machine is saving us like an hour and a half every single day. And this is only in the last three weeks. So... The point that I'm making here is that the small improvements lead up to the big improvements. Yeah. And if we didn't engage Paddy to focus on fixing these small things, we never would have even thought about the big thing. Yeah. So the small stop and fixes lead us to the big improvements. Yeah, that's mad. And do you find like so many of these principles we talk about, you know, does that like lead to people like applying this concept to their own personal lives as well. If I could all, uh, all just time. kind oh. of jump in here quickly, Matt, you've kind of put yourself a little bit off a frame there. Oh yeah, Santos. so I have. <laughs> good good, good stop just... and fix. <laughs> Is Thank that right? Am I in frame here? Uh, a little bit more to your right. To my right, like that? Yep, that's good. Thank yeah, you. Perfect. perfect. Look at that, stop and fix in action from producer Roscoe there. Yeah. Internalizing it, this guy's getting it. Yeah. Right. Leave that in, Roscoe, because that's a good wee bit to keep uh, in the podcast. <laughs> Sorry, my question was, yeah, people taking it outside of work and applying to their own lives, basically. 100% It's like all these lean concepts. People think lean is a manufacturing thing that, start, yes, it started with Toyota and everybody recognizes that, but it's a mindset. All of these lean concepts are mindsets. Mm. Stop and fix can be brought into your daily life. Stop and fix can be brought into relationships. Stop and fix can be brought into the way you think. Mm. We should be stopping and fixing, reevaluating everything and questioning everything. Yeah. But do it there and then. Yeah, yeah. You know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that kind of nicely brings us into level three, which is where we can't talk about societal, global, <laughs> philosophical impacts of, of this yeah. concept of stop and fix. And you already mentioned one, actually. I mean, uh, we can talk about whether we include this or not, but like we have had a working relationship now for over six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a message from you maybe like two, three weeks ago where you, you, you effectively just said a, a WhatsApp. You're like, hey, just, just a heads up, just want to do a quick pull the cord and, and stop and fix here because something had happened that uh, wasn't expected. Mm -hmm. I was like, this guy, Ryan, has really, he really, really like talks the talk. So yeah. you you stopped and fixed 
uh, really a communication error between us. Yeah. And that just brought total clarity and total mm-hmm. everything. And I was like, this guy is pulling on Dawn Cords in his relationships, in his work, in his everything. And I, I really, really appreciated that. And I benefited from that because yeah. how often in our relationships do you let those small, as you described them earlier, those small wee threads yeah. just go down the line. Those small wee threads just go down the line. And before you know it, you've got a whole massive bundle of threads and then you have this big massive blowout <laughs> or a big falling out or something yeah. like that. Do you know what I mean? That's right. right. And another really good example at, at the... At seat matters as well. Something we do, and we're we've got better at this over the years. Is in every workplace, there's there's uh, differences in opinion about what way to do something, and sometimes there is tension between people. And something that we've tried to get really good at is stopping and fixing. Mm. Whoever's involved, let's go to the canteen. Let's get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. What's your side? What are you saying? What are you saying? Nice. Let's sort this out. Yeah. Is there a better way we can communicate going forward? Yep, everybody's agreeable. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. Because if we don't nip it in the bud, it just spirals into this big thing and then two people aren't getting on and it affects the culture. Stop and fix. Yeah. Stop and fix. Stop and fix. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's interesting just you saying that. I have realized that in our marriage, we practice stop and fix. So we went through training like maybe seven years ago on this thing called uh, clearing or it's like nonviolent communication or something like that. It's a way for, it's a framework for for discussing issues and, and conflicts and dealing with them early. Yeah. And the, the metaphor that the person used was, you know, in your daily kind of life, in your family life, there'll be these wee tiny, tiny, tiny micro tears, you know, like, oh, you loaded the dishwasher the wrong way or, oh, uh-huh. I can't believe you did this. Like really small things that are not really worth calling out, but they describe them as like a wee pebble. And over time, those wee pebbles just get built up and built up and built up until all of a sudden you've got this big dam. Yeah. And then inevitably the dam breaks and you're having this fight and you're like, why are we fighting? What's this all about? Like that. And you can trace it back to, ah, it's like these 10 small issues that we didn't stop and we didn't fix. And it's now resulted in this kind of larger uh, yes. argument or this larger falling out. Yeah. If only we had have stopped and fixed. And so the way it's clear and works is, you know, anytime that the kids are in bed or, you've, you, you know, they're sleeping in the car, you, we just turn to each other and we say, look, do you need to clear about anything? And the other person will think and they'll think, they'll think actually, yeah, there's three wee small things. There's this small thing, there's that small thing, there's this slightly bigger thing. And you stop and you fix rather than letting it all build up and you're having a massive blowout over something seemingly small. So mm-hmm. that's definitely a way stop and fix has been applied in a more kind of philosophical way, I suppose. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. And I liked what you said earlier about the standards, keeping the standards really, really high. And stop and fix is a really good way to do that. Yeah. And I remember, uh, again, this was a, an old mentor of mine. He said something to me that really, really shocked me whenever I first heard it. And I didn't agree with it, though I do agree with it now. And he said, Matthew, you deserve whatever you tolerate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that can be applied to how people treat you. So if people, if someone treats you in a way you don't want to be treated... And you don't stop and fix it. And you let, as we said, you let that yeah. wee thread go by. You're not educating that person on how they're going to treat you next time. Yeah. And next thing you know, you can build up a lot of resentment towards somebody because you haven't called them out on the small, tiny threads in your relationship that mm-hmm. annoy them. I really love this thread uh, thing. I'm keeping yeah. this going. Yeah. And so I think stop and fix relationally is a really good way to maintain high standards of how you expect others to treat you and, 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 and everything like that. The, the first step, I think, is that identifying that you have the power to stop and fix and getting good at recognizing, oh, this is a stop and fix scenario. I could actually stop right now and fix this. And once you do that, you actually develop a habit. Mm. So it's all about developing a habit of stopping and fixing. So if we can stop and fix the remote control for the gates, if we can stop and fix, you know, I got an email on the way up here today and as soon as I pulled in, I unsubscribed from the the email because I I didn't want to get it. So I stop and fix, stop and fix. So once you build up these small stop and fixes everywhere, that starts becoming your way of thinking Mm. and it becomes a habit. But then this is where the real power is. Whatever organization you're working with, whatever team you're working with, imagine the whole team thinking like this. And that's all we've done at, at our company. All we've done is developed a culture where every single person is encouraged to stop and fix. Mm. And that's why everything gets better. That's why quality improves. That's how we can serve the customer far better. And that's why life is better. Stop and fix. It's the upward spiral. Yeah. I love that. 
That should be a wee mini book, The Upward yeah. Spiral. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. So Ryan's very <laughs> kindly offered to share these cards with everybody. So the infamous cards that Ryan was talking about earlier, just completely give it away to you guys for free. There'll be a link in the description of wherever you're listening to this episode. Print them out. Throw them all over your factory. Ryan's got a magnet on the back of his, and uh, he mentioned the Pareto Pyramid. Um, those are all ideas that you can take and you can apply to your company. Literally, after listening to this episode, you can stop wherever you are and implement this and, and fix the processes of capturing ideas uh, in your company. And again, just the link in the description is where you'll get the template for that completely free of charge. And the other thing we always talk about is come and see. Uh, come and see it for yourself. Book a Lee Made Simple Tour, where you can come and see all these incredible things in action. You know, it's really, it's more and more, I think I've, I've been up to the factory now maybe six times, and I think what I'm starting to get out of it every time I go is I'm looking more and more at the team. Yeah, I'm looking more and more <laughs> at the people and what they're doing in their specific roles. Yeah, And to see elements of stop and fix happening in real time before your eyes, I just describe it as it just unlocks something in my brain where I can come back to our business, which is totally different sector, totally different industry, totally different environment and everything. But it, it it's a living metaphor to see those lean principles in action that just yeah. set it, it, all the lights in my brain turn on <coughs> every single time <coughs> I, I'm driving back down the road from the factory. I've got a million different ideas and it's 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 real, really an energizing experience. So yeah, again, link in the description uh, to book a lean made simple tour for you and your company. And you guys are... You guys are like nearly sold out for the whole quarter, haven't you? It's really, really busy with tours, yeah, yeah. But uh, another thing I would like to offer just right now on the podcast is the email address for Lean Made Simple. It's info at Lean Made Simple. And just shoot us a question. If you have any questions on Stop and Fix, any questions on any of the concepts that we talk about on the podcast, we're more than happy to help anyone with their continuous improvement journey. So cool. Awesome, man. Lots of goodies at the end, as always which is really, really cool. Thank you so much for listening all the way through. We really, really appreciate you spending this time with us. And as always, we, we really hope that it's valuable. If there's any way that we can make this uh, podcast more valuable to you, uh, please let us know. We know that people listen to this podcast during their morning meetings. We know that they've put entire companies uh, through each of the episodes, which is really, really exciting. And so, Ryan, I, I just want to thank you as always for uh, educating us and, and inspiring us. Uh, it's been really, really fun and I really appreciate it. Good job. Thank you.